Good morning, saints. This is Steve Van Cura of Bread of Life Bible Study. Uh, we are going to do a book study today. Uh, this is one of the epistles of Paul. Uh, he actually wrote 14 different books in the Bible. Uh, he's a busy guy. Now, some of those he did while in prison at Rome. Those are called the Pauline, I'm sorry, the prison epistles, the, the prison epistles, okay? But, uh, and then others were written when he was a free man, but um, on his various missionary Jew, uh, journeys, uh, his missionary obligation was to preach the gospel, okay? Uh, he started preaching to Jews. He is a Jew, a uh, converted Jew on the road to Damascus. But then uh, because he ran some difficulties trying to preach to the Jewish peoples in the book of Acts, uh, he basically kind of washed his hands of preaching to Jews and said that, you know, he pointed out that God sent him to preach to the Gentiles, okay? Uh, Peter was assigned to preach to the Jews. Uh, Paul was a highly educated guy. Peter was just a simple fisherman. But that's the way God works. He, he chooses the least able in man's eyes to do a job sometimes. God will always, always ask us to do something we can't do in our own strength or power so that it, we cannot rely on self. Everything God asks us to do is something that we cannot do except by, for, and through him. That, that's important to understand, okay? So the first epistle or book we're going to talk about is Colossians. Everybody has a handout. Uh, I'm just going to do about one and a half, not quite. Well, actually, yeah, we're going to probably do all of chapter one. There's four chapters in the book of Colossians. We're going to do all of chapter one and a good chunk of chapter two, okay? And then next week we'll try to finish it up, okay? But uh, the churches were always named based on their location. So there was a church at Rome, a church at Colossus, a church at Philippi, etc. Uh, and so it, they didn't have denominations. There were no denominations. All right. Um, of course, some people tried to divide things up. I am of Paul, you know, I am of Apollos, or whatever, different people's doctrines and things of this sort. But see, Christ is not divided, okay? Denominations are entirely a development of man, okay? They're doctrines of men. Why do we have thousands and thousands of denominations, okay? Uh, but they, denominationalism is basically to take the body of Christ and chop it all up into little pieces and give each one a name based on their doctrines. And what are those doctrines? Doctrines of men, okay? The vast majority of them, okay? Uh, the only truth that matters is the true inspired Word of God. The Bible says that uh, the that prophecy is not subject to private interpretation. You know what that means? It means my little noodle brain up here is not able to understand this Word of God. The Word of God is God that the Bible says holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, this Word of God literally is the life of God. And I cannot understand it in the natural realm. I have to. The only way I can really get the truth is through the Spirit of truth. And that's so important to understand. You know, we have to approach the Word of God in a very, very humble way. All right? Lay aside every previous thoughts that you thought the Bible said or you were told the Bible said and approach it to see what it says, okay? If, if we read into Scripture what we think it's supposed to say, then you are blinded and you will be fooled. And you'll walk away not knowing the truth, okay? Hum humility is so important, okay? But anyway, so this is uh, a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Coloss, all right? And uh, so I'm going to just start reading there. And it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Coloss. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, okay? Uh, now this is a salutation, okay? 
uh, Paul always does this, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and, Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's always grace and peace. And there's always just two individuals, okay? The Father and the Son. You know, if you go look at all the epistles, you know, none of them say from God and the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, okay? No, they all two, the Father and the Son, because the Father sent the Son, okay? And, and so, <clears throat> of course, the Spirit, being the Spirit of God, is the empowerment of all, okay? So notice that these are brothers in Christ. Now, wait a minute, they're all related? Well, in a sense, okay, there's natural families and there's spiritual families, okay? Now, remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? You are of your father the devil. There's only two spiritual fathers in the entire earth. That's it. The devil and God. That is all. When we're born the first time, we are of our father, the devil. All right? He planted a seed. What are seeds? Words. And Adam and Eve, you know, were deceived by the words, the seeds, the sperm of the devil. And so that they, you know, although God begot man in his image, once they sin, they beget sons and daughters after their image in the nature and likeness <coughs> of the devil. And so that sin nature gets passed down to every single human being that was ever born. So the only pathway out of that is to get born again. We have to be born of a new spirit, all right? Unless a man is born again, he cannot see, enter, you know, the kingdom of God, all right? Born from above. All right. So, but anyway, if you are born of above, then you are brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus one time said, who are my mother, brother, and sisters? Those that obey the will of God, that's them, okay? Because they've got the spirit of Christ in them and they can obey, all right? Because without, apart from the spirit, we can do nothing, all right? Nothing. But anyway... Uh, Adelphos is the Greek word here, which means from the same womb, all right? That literally, God in that sense is, a, is like a womb. But all life comes from him, okay? And uh, he's, he's almighty God. This is kind of strange. I don't know if you know this, but in Hebrew, almighty God, which is what God said to Abram, it could be translated the mighty-breasted one because he provides everything. Okay, in a sense, there's kind of feminine characteristics of God because he has kids. The whole purpose of this business is that God wants a family. He wants a family, all right? Uh, that's why the creation is temporary, all right? God's eternal. Why would he make a temporary creation? The things that are seen are temporary and are going to pass away because during that time, that period, everybody, angels, and human beings have to choose. Got to decide. And who I choose to serve is going to determine my eternity. That makes sense? You know, it's, uh, God doesn't send anybody to hell. All right? It's people's choices that determine heaven and hell. That's, so, that's important. Okay? Anyway, so he says, the faithful brothers in Christ. Because remember, if we're born again, we're in him. Remember that prepositional phrase? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. He's the head of the body, all right? The church. The church are those people that are born of the Spirit, all right, by the Word of God, through the Word of God, and we're brothers and, si we're brothers and sisters together with Christ. We are his family through God the Father. Make sense? Okay. So anyway, uh, he says, Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, all right, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, all right? Now, this is agape love, you know. There are actually five, or I'm sorry, four different kinds of Greek words of love described in the Greek um, in the Bible. But agape is this one, okay? This is the God kind of love, all right? The uh, Bible says God is love, right? Okay. Uh, love is unconditional love. That, that's what this is. 
That means that I don't care how bad you are, how many sins you've done, you know, maybe you even cursed God before, you know, whatever. You're the worst kind of sinner that ever was. But you know what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's unconditional. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember what I said? It's a choice, you know. And God the Father, his spirit is out wooing, you know, through the hearts of men and women to choose. Come. No one can come to me, Jesus said, except that the Father first draw him. All right. Well, I'm, I'm telling you something. The devil's out there wooing people also. Okay. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. But remember back in the book of Genesis, God told Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. You must master it. Well, when there's a knock at the door, you better find out who's there, you know? It just, because, <laughs> you know, it could be good or bad. You know, you know what I'm saying? So, but anyway, uh, this love that we have for all the saints is because God is love. And, and we're born of his spirit, and that automatically, it's a family love to, to others in the faith. Does that make sense? The Bible says the love, agape love of God, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, remember we talked about the word, what, what's it produce? You know, fruit uh, is the offspring of a seed, all right? And, and the Word of God produces fruit. Once a person is born of the Spirit, the Bible says that we manifest something called the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Galatians 5.22 says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, that's agape, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control, okay? I, I like that last one. Boy, I, I, I've needed that for a long time. Self-control, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, again, it's the Spirit of Christ in us. And as we yield to the Spirit, uh, this life of Christ manifests more and more in us, okay? And if uh, there's a knock at the door and it's something other than the fruit of the Spirit, well, you have to say no to it, remember? But the power and grace of God is given for us to be able to say no to the devil's knocks, all right? Does that make sense? Okay. But it says this faith and love spring from a hope stored up in heaven for us. What is this hope? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen with the natural eyes. Okay, hope. I, I, like, I like this definition. Hope is a confident expectation in the goodness of God. Oh, man, I love that. It's just hope. Uh, you know, in, in Christ... We have hope. But what is that hope? This is his promise. Eternal life. That's the hope. That's it, okay? It's being born into the family, but in the process, we got to go through the wilderness and have tests and trials because God always tests our faith to see if I'm sincere, if I'm serious, you see, if I'll hold fast. He who holds fast to the end shall be saved, okay? And, and so we are going to be tested, both by God, and some of that is allowed by God, right? It's not necessarily, you know, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. God tempts no one, no one. So when the devil comes, remember, what does the devil have access to? Flesh. Only the flesh, the dust from the earth. That's what our old man is made of. So the only thing that can respond to that temptation of the devil is the flesh. Now, I may not even know it's still there. I may think, man, I finally conquered all my flesh. Well, guess what? That's, that's like Peter said, everybody else may deny you, Lord, but I never will. I never will. Je Jesus had just given a prophecy that when the Son of Man, you know, when... Was it the yeah, the, well, he said, yeah, that when the Son of Man, I forgot, is lifted up or something, I, uh, the flock will scatter from me or something. I forgot, I can't quote it exactly. But, you know, and so he was given this prophecy that, that when he's taken, that all of his 
apostles would scatter, okay? But Peter said, not me, Lord. I'll never deny you. Everybody else might, but I won't. Well, you know, what's that? Pride, boy. And what caused the devil to fall? Ooh, pride. So the minute I got it, Lord, I can handle this myself. I don't need you. Now, here's what people do sometimes. We think, remember I said, there, I, I don't know if I said that, but there's only two ways to live life. That's it. One, two. You know, one is in the flesh by my own strength or power, and the other is by grace through faith. That's it. That's it. Now, and they are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive. All right? Now, in other words, if I'm in grace through faith, then works are not something I have to do to make God happy, you know, to please him or something like that. No, he's all, you know, Christ did all that. It's his work. You understand what I'm saying? You know, there's something very interesting in the creation story. You know, when God created six days, he creates everything, right? And he rested on the seventh day, all right? On the, late on the sixth day, he made man. So, and so man's first day was a day of rest. And that's the pattern for us. God works, then rests. But man rests and works. You and I, when we're born into the kingdom, we first rest in the finished work of Christ. We're created unto good works, not our own works. My work is to find out what he wants me to do. See, it's not what I think I ought to do and then ask God to bless it. What, what's prayer? Finding the will of God and coming into agreement with it. Not say, Lord, I got this plan and I want you to bless it. Okay? No, we got the cart before the horse. Okay? Uh, my job is to rest. What, that's what the Sabbath is all about. The Sabbath is resting in the finished work of Christ. See, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will follow after us. Okay? So it, it's real easy to get to think that I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this, or whatever else like that, and miss God. Because I'm under works instead of grace. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, and that is so easy. I mean, just, oops, you, you fall into it, okay? But see, that's what the flesh does. It's very proud of itself. The flesh is very proud of itself. I did this, I did that. But what did Jesus say? The flesh profiteth nothing. What did Jesus say? Of myself I can do nothing. I only do what I hear you know, or I only say what I hear the Father saying. And the works that I do, it's not me. It's the Father in me that doeth the works, okay? So sometimes we have to really stop and think about how am I approaching life, okay? It's very easy to mix these up. A little bit of spirit, a little bit of flesh, you know, um, whatever. Domination. What's that? A little spirit and a little flesh and you have denomination. Yes. Now, that's a good point, because one of the things that Paul's going to talk about later are the doctrines of men that make void the power of God. It's so easy. Did you know we say, well, we're not under the law. That's the Old Testament, the law of Moses. But did you, did you know that we could create all kinds of laws for ourselves? And denominations make all kinds of laws. Got to do this, don't do that, whatever, you know. You know, I... I know in the Old Testament, for example, it says you're not supposed to eat pork, you're not supposed to eat catfish because they're bottom feeders or whatever, all else like that. But, and I know people, but Paul said everything is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. It's okay, you can eat it, you know. All right? Even, even food sacrificed to idols, but don't eat it in, somebody that know, you know, in front of somebody to lead them astray. You know what I'm saying? But um, it's so easy, again, for... Somebody else's rules and regulation. And I, I, know, I know people that say, well, I would never eat pork, you know. I would never do it, you know. Okay, that's fine. You know, if your Bible said, Paul said, I, I do everything to maintain a clean conscience before God and man. 
But he also said, sometimes to the Jews, I become like a Jew. You know, to vegetarians, I'll be a vegetarian. Okay, whatever. But whatever it takes that I don't cause anybody to stumble. Okay? And, and a clean conscience is not to do something against your heart. Okay? Now, I'm going to tell you something. Sin for one person may be not a sin for somebody else. That, you understand that? Okay, now let's just say a guy, a guy used to be an alcoholic or whatever else like that, and he is resolved. I just should not touch any of that stuff. And so he never does. And, and if he ever, somebody offered him a little sip of wine or something like that, he'd know, no, 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 I, you know, I can't do that. But everyone has to follow their own conscience. That's what God gave us, a moral compass down inside, and it's different for everybody. But you have to be true to your conscience, okay? And if we get out of line, then if we fail, then we confess our sins because he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so I'm the one that's got to walk my line. Does that, that make sense? All right. You know. Now, I'm going to say, as we grow in the faith, I'll find out maybe the, something I didn't think I should you know, should never do or something like that, you know, I'll, I'll change my understanding and perspective of something, okay? All right, now I can't get too bogged down here, but let's move on, okay? So the hope that is, is up there is um, eternal life, okay? Now it says, this, is, this word of truth, the gospel has come to you all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing, okay? Because remember, it's the sperma, it's the seed. The sower is the son of man, the seed is the word of God, and the soil of the hearts of men. All right, Just as it has been doing since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Okay, So Epaphras, it says you learned it, the gospel from Epaphras, okay? the dear fellow servant. Now Epaphras was apparently the guy that went to Colossus preached the gospel, and a bunch of people were born again, and this church at Coloss was birthed, okay? And now Paul is sending these follow-up letters, you know, uh, to see how you guys doing. Uh, you know, in the meantime, he's getting reports about things you're getting confused about, or things you're doing right. So all of Paul's epistles include usually some correction and exhortation um, and whatever it takes, you know, because he's trying to teach them as an apostle. That's what he is. He, he is, a, in a sense, a, an arm of Christ. All right. Remember, Ephesians 4.11 says, When Jesus ascended upon high, he gave gifts unto men, some apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, Okay, for them to teach the saints to do the work of the ministry. All right, now, sometimes we think, well, the clergy, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, their job is to do the work of the ministry. No, 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 no. Their job is to train us to do the work of the ministry. We're the one that goes, that goes to prisons, get on the street, preach the gospel, you know, pray for people, on and on and on and on. Okay, uh, we have a job. Remember, we're created unto what? Good works, all right? And, and, and the good works are teaching, preaching, healing, you know, th this work of the ministry, okay? And for that, God gives gifts. Now, these, you know, five-fold gifts, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, those are called <clears throat> ordination offices of the Spirit, the, okay? There, there, are, uh, there are gifts of the Spirit, offices of the Spirit, uh, and there is fruit of the Spirit. Okay, see that? The fruit of the Spirit, that's what I already said, love, joy, peace, patience, etc. That is simply the nature, likeness, and character of Christ, which I will manifest if he lives in me. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit if somebody looks and watches you or something like that. Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. Now, if I'm cussing up a storm or stealing things, they're going to say, well, that's not the right fruit, you know. That doesn't fit, okay? It's somebody who says something but doesn't live it, okay? You know what that's called? A hypocrite. 
Now, let, uh, let me just explain. Because many people that are in church haven't really experienced a born again birth, okay, by the Spirit. They're, they believe Jesus is Lord because men said so. Does that make sense? So if their heart hasn't changed, then they may not bear the fruit. Okay, does that make sense? All right. The fruit is the proof of the pudding. All right, does that make sense? But I'm going to tell you something. It's a terrible thing to be going to church and trying to be what you're not. You're trying to be on the outside what you're not on the inside. You understand what I'm saying? That's what a hypocrite is. And, but that's a very painful place to be because the person in that boat doesn't understand what's going on. Usually because somebody's never stopped to explain all this. You know, if, if, you know, if that's my job, that's your job, okay? To, you know, to sort of judge things, not to condemn, but to help, okay? Does that make sense? And, and so, anyway, um, all right. So, anyway, Epaphras was the guy who brought the gospel, preached the gospel, says, for this reason, every day since we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. Now, Paul one time said, I am your father through the gospel. Now, what's that mean? Does he have kids? Well, in a way, the book of Genesis said that God gave a commission to God's people, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Remember, everything is first in the natural, then in the spiritual. Okay, well, God, yeah, he wants natural families to produce and replicate, but ultimately, it, it always boils down to the spiritual fulfillment. Okay, all right, God wants a family, and he wants me to grow the family. All right, and the way I do that is to spread the seed of the Father. Okay, that's the Word of God. That's the Gospel. That's what this fella, what's his name, Epaphras, was doing. Okay, he was being fruitful and multiplying. He's preaching the Gospel. People were born again and into the family. Okay, that's what this is about. All right, but notice that Paul said, My little children, for whom I am in travail again until Christ be fully formed in you. The word travail is what a woman goes through to have a baby. You know, you know, I've never been there, but, <laughs> you know, uh, but those that have, you know, maybe not a lot of fun, okay? But travail, Paul's talking about groaning in prayer, okay? And, and he says that I, I travailed to get you born again. Now I'm going to travail that you grow up, okay? Now every parent understands that. It's one travail to go through to get your baby, but that kid's got to grow to 18 before he leaves the house, man, and you're going to be a lot, a lot more travail <laughs> between now and 18. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but anyway, so that's the responsibility. We're supposed to be building this family. And, and uh, you know, if we got kids that are getting out of line, well, man, it's our responsibility to do something about it, right? All right. So, <clears throat> but anyway, so that's what he's doing. He says he's not stopped praying. He prayed to get him born again, but now he's still praying. All right, and it says that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will, give all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and to please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God and being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. You see, so it's one thing to get somebody born again, but you keep groaning and praying you know, that God would impart wisdom, understanding, you know, love of the scriptures, love of your fellow man, and things of this sort, okay? So that they continue to grow, become fruitful uh, in their ministry, etc. Now, I, earlier I said there's a five-hold um, uh, ministry gift by, by Christ when he ascended from the dead, but there's actually 14 different charis gifts, what are called charisma, that means grace gift. Okay, and, and what it might be exhortation. There's one that Paul calls just exhortation. Some people just have that God-given ability to encourage. That's what exhortation is. It's you can do it, you know, get back up and, and uh, you know, here's some hints or helps or whatever else like that. There's a grace of giving, you know. 
there's all kinds, you know, just, just the ones that Paul talks about, that God imparts grace and power. That's what grace is. It's his power, okay? And, and uh, uh, once again, now we, we, we can live life either by, through the flesh or grace, okay? Grace is God's power, not my power, okay? And, and God imparts certain desires, you know? If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Well, God is interested. It's interesting that, see, God will put his will inside of you. And then you start thinking, well, I'd sure like to do this or that. And you think, well, I th you might think you came up with it. But no, you didn't come up with it. He put it there, <laughs> you know. And now you're going to pray and ask God to help you do that. The very thing he wants you to do. You know, but that's the way he does it, okay? If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. For herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples, okay? It is God that works within you, both to will and to do of his good purpose, okay? And, you know, we think, man, I come up with this great idea. <laughs> you know, not, it's always God. It's always God. If, you know, I'm saying I can come up with my own ideas and then I'm wondering why it doesn't work, you know. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. But it says that uh, we need to give thanks to the Father who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of the kingdom of light, that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, okay, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All right, the Bible says, the next one it says, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. By him all things are created, by and for him, in heaven, earth, visible and invisible, thrones or powers or rulers and authorities. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he is the supreme. I know, wow, this is, this is amazing. You know what's interesting? If you go to the Old Testament and then the New Testament, you go to the Old Testament, for example, creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, and there was darkness over the face of the deep. And God said, light be. All right? Well, in the Old Testament, it says God, the Father. He's the creator, Elohim. Okay? Uh, Yahweh. And there is no other creator but him none. There's none beside me. No, not one. But then you go to the New Testament. Whoops. And it says, no, Jesus is the creator. All things were made by, for, and through him. And there's not been anything made or created that wasn't by, for, and through him. Now, wait a second. I just read in the Old Testament that Yahweh was the creator. And then in the New Testament, it says, no, 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 no. And did you know that in the Old Testament, Yahweh says, there's only one Savior. There's only one, and it's me. There's no other Savior but me. And then you go to the New Testament, and all over it calls Jesus the Savior. But notice this, it says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So who's the Savior? It's the Father through the Son. Who's the Creator? The Father through the Son. Does that make sense? All right. Now, who are you? All of the above. Ah, is that possible? Jesus said... To the guy down laying down there on the ground, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees flipped out. <laughs> Nobody can forgive sins but God. You know, but see, the man had a curse on him. Where did curses come from? Sin, disobedience. You know. So Jesus said, so that you understand, and I can prove that the Son of Man does have ability to forgive sin, he said to the man, stand up, take up your mat, and go home. Boom. 
power of God flows? Well, the reason the guy was crippled because of sin. Somewhere, him, family line, you know, genetic, gen, you know, what? You know, familial curses. But he was healed. The curse was broken. You yes, so that is proof. Now, you know, if I'm praying for somebody, and like that man who was crying out before God, there are two men came up to pray. One was a publican. And he was yelling, hollering, couldn't even look up. And he was beating his chest, saying, Oh, God, forgive me, a sinner. And another guy, a Pharisee, stands up and he said he prays to be seen by men. Okay? And he starts bragging on himself. You know, I do this and that. I'm not that like this publican over here. You know, wow, his prayers didn't get any higher than the rafters. Okay, you know, but Jesus said to the publican, now that man went away justified. All right. Well, can we tell somebody that God forgives you? Yes. I believe we can. Yes. We have discerning of spirits. You can tell whether somebody's sincere on some, about something, you know, and they need a word of encouragement that God loves you exactly as you are. He does not judge you, you know. We can stand in the stead of Christ and minister in his power, in his ability here. Not mine, but we can be doers of that word and God will honor his word. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, they'll speak in new tongues, okay? Uh, if they drink any deadly or you know, demonic thing, it won't hurt them. hurt them. You can handle snakes. Now, that's not talking about handling snakes. It means dealing with demonic powers and whatever. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, we have authority in the name of Jesus. We can do it, okay? Anything he does, the things that I do, shall you do also. And even greater things than these shall you do because I go unto the Father. So we can step out in faith and act and do. You know, when Elijah, he understood, stood one time, he said, you know, except at my word, there shall be neither dew nor rain for three and a half years. And so then when he prayed and he saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand, he, he knew the time was up and the rain was going to start. And uh, Elisha, who had that anointing of Elijah, one time told a woman, he said, about this time next year, this woman didn't have any kids. He said, you're going to embrace a, a, a child, a male child. Well, what, was that a prophecy? Yes, but it had power. He spoke it, and it came to pass. And see, we can do that. We can do that. But we put, open your mouth, and I will fill it. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning to teach me as one being taught. I've not been rebellious. I've not drawn back. The words that I speak are life. They're life to those that find them, healing to all their bones. And we can speak those words, okay? We put them in our mouth, in our hearts, and it comes out with power. It comes out with power. And, you know, that kind of stretches the denominational thinking, but that's what the Bible says, okay? Make sense? All right. Now, he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead. Now, what are we talking about? When sin entered the world, it, con it, uh, it corrupted the entire world. I'll say it, the universe, okay? I don't think it touched heaven, you know, the third heaven or wherever God is, okay? But, you know, there's a corrupt heaven and earth down here. Okay, and God promises a new heaven and a new earth in which dwells righteousness and evil will never arise again. He's talking about a new creation. Now, we entered the first creation through birth, all right, and we're going to, we enter the new creation through birth, all right. First is a natural birth, then comes a spiritual birth. But God, remember how God cleanses things, all right, all throughout the Old Testament, there's two ways he, you know, for example, the articles of, 
uh, furniture and uh, utensils and things like that they use in the tabernacle. Remember, the tabernacle is a type of you and I, okay? We are. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God? You know, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price, all right? That in that tabernacle, there's a holy ho of holies, a holy place and, and a court, you know? And, but but all, they had things that they used there, and they all had to be sanctified. They could not be used in a holy place. The whole temple was anointed with blood and oil and all these kind of things and sanctified with prayer and, and uh, to be, had to be cleansed. God will not use an unclean vessel, okay? That's, there, there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. And the scripture tells us that if we cleanse ourselves from dishonor, then God will be able to use us, all right? Then, all right? But he won't use an unclean vessel, okay? Uh, so you remember when Jesus went into the temple and he turned over all the tables of money changers and all that kind of stuff? He cleansed the temple, all right? And, and that was something in the natural, but the same thing is true spiritually. Before he can use us, he has to cleanse us, all right? Now, the way he cleansed things was first by washing by water and then burning by fire. Wash by water, burning by fire. Now, that's going to be fulfilled in the entire creation. So in Genesis chapter 6, when, the man, when mankind was corrupted all over the earth, God said, whoops, you know, all flesh has corrupted itself. I'm going to destroy all flesh. But he put eight people, Noah and his family, into the ark. What? There's three arks in the Bible. Three. Ark of Moses, Ark of the Covenant, and Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark had three levels. Represents the three parts of your and my being. The ark is Christ. Okay? And when the judgment comes, it's first washed by water. And in the end, when judgment comes in the end, Fire. The whole creation is destroyed by fire. See? Now you and I, John the Baptist said, I baptize with water under repentance. But he who comes after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire. Okay? Because for God, we can't go to heaven and be corrupt. Okay? Ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Okay? Uh, so we submit ourselves, therefore, unto God, you know, and yield all of our being to him. And I can't save myself. I can't sanctify myself, but he can. You know what I'm saying? So uh, the point being that in the end, uh, see, the whole creation is corrupted. So God had to start with a new seed. The first seed, Adam, he always does everything with seed. All right? So Adam was the seed for the human race, but since he was corrupted, have to have a new seed. You know, and the same thing is true with everything else in creation. It has to be, the creation's going to be made new, brand new, okay? And the old's going to pass away. And it said the new creation will be perfect. Evil will never arise again. So this little blip in time, I'll say, because see, God inhabits eternity. For God, there is no time. But the physical creation is a place just made temporary so that everybody, all creatures, can make a choice. Who are you going to serve? But when it's all over, all the choices have been made, it's going to end. It comes to an end, and then everybody gets what they chose, you see? You know? So we have to understand this plan, okay? And you, you can, we can't say, well, I'll put it off, you know. I'll get saved one of these days or whatever. Oh my goodness. We are in a race. The Bible says that uh, this race that we're on, he said only one wins the race. Okay? And that's what Paul was talking about in a race. He said, you know, there's only, only one's going to win. Well, you mean there's only two people running? Well, that's true. That The race is between your old man and the new man. That's it. Now who's going to win? The race is against time. You have only so many heartbeats. Boom, 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 boom. And one day there's no more. So uh, who wins the race? It's the one we feed. 
If we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. If we sow to the spirit, we will reap life. You know, so this is not more complicated than we we think. You know, it's not that hard. But you know, we have to choose. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And when we make the choice, then comes the helper. You know what the helper is, okay? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power, the ability, the way. I am the way to the Father. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And when we make our choice, you're not the one that has to perform it and do it. No. Once, once we put our hand in the plow, the helper shows up, okay? The helper, now, that's the thing about a helper. What does a helper do? Nothing. Until you do something. <laughs> you know, and as soon as I start, he jumps in and provides the power, the ability, the direction, and everything to accomplish God's will for me. Does that, does that make sense? You know? All right. So, okay. Once you were alienated from God, enemies in your mind because of your evil. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. You might say, well, I don't feel holy. That, well, see, holiness begin, has a beginning and a consummation or a finish. Okay, it starts in our inner man when we give a, get a new heart. Remember that incorruptible seed which is sown in our hearts, which is the life of Christ. You know, he that is born of God, that's him, the new man, cannot sin. He does not sin. He cannot sin because God's seed indwells him. And as I yield to that inner man in me, he, as I yield to him, he will, you know, run, run the show. You know, if I'm fighting against him, uh, you know, then, then I may not make a lot of progress, okay? But it says, you know, we just need to learn to yield to the, to the, to the Spirit, okay? Does that make sense? And, you know, um, I want you to notice this. It says, He has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish. So these saints, the hagios, the holy ones, we are that because He indwells us not because of our own goodness or anything else. It's Him, okay? Uh, he's, he's holy, you know what I'm saying? And as I yield, He will change me. Now, there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians. Jesus Christ has made unto us uh, wisdom from God and righteousness and peace, or I'm sorry, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, okay? Now, this is, it's a progress, all right? We, when we're born again, we're given that free gift or credited of righteousness. That means a perfect, sinless standing before God. So that when he looks at me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as perfect. That's why in the scriptures he calls me, you know, a saint, a holy one. Because it's credited to me. All right? But as I yield to it, it begins to work its way out to sanctify me more and more into his likeness. Does that, does that make sense? All right. You know, so it's, it is, has a beginning and it has a process. All right. And, you know, for example, remember the parable of the sower? That some falls in good ground and produces a crop 30, 60, and 100 fold. You ever wonder what that means? Okay. Well, the good ground is that dirt. You know, the sower is the son of man, the seed is the word of God, and the soil are hearts of men, okay? But the crop, the crop for God are human beings, family members, okay? That's us. The whole reason for this whole earth is to be the dirt in which God sows the seed, okay? And, you know, when you grow a garden and put some seed in the ground and it's harvest time, you don't can the seed or can the dirt, do you? No. The dirt's just there to hold the seed, all right? The only thing you're going to keep is what grew from the seed. And the same thing is true in us. The dirt, see, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God did, Jesus did not come to save our flesh. He's going to give us a new body, all right? And that's called redemption, 
okay, and lift up your eyes. When you see these things come to pass, your redemption, that's the salvation of the body, okay? Your redemption draweth nigh. All right, so th this is a progress. 30, 60, and 100 fold, you could call it a percent of Christ. All right, 30%, 30 is a, somebody who's about 30% Christ in nature, likeness, and everything, okay? 60%, all right, and then 100%. Somebody that's 100%. I mean, that's what, like Paul was talking about, I have been crucified. It's no longer I that live. I mean, I just now live by faith in the Son of God. That's my life. My life is Him. And there's none else of the old man. He's gone. All right? That's a hundredfold Christian. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, is there anything else to back that up? Well, Paul said at the resurrection, there are three levels of glory. When it's all done and the resurrection happens, Guess what? His glory shines out from us. Okay? Jesus is coming in his people before he comes for his people. And that, you know, mountain of transfiguration where Jesus shined like the sun. See, that's going to happen to all believers. All right? But there'll be various levels of glory. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. At the resurrection, there's three levels of glory. There's sun glory, moon glory, and star glory. That's 30, 60, and 100 fold. Okay? And, you know, not everybody gets the same, you know, level. In heaven, they're all levels of authority. Uh, remember one time Jesus talked about uh, giving certain individuals that served him, servants, uh, gave one, uh, one talent, five talents, ten talents, or something like that. Then he goes away on a long journey, comes back, guy with one talent hid his in the dirt, you know, and uh, the Lord said, you wicked and evil servant, you know, you should have done something with what I gave you, okay? But he hid it in the dirt. What, what's that mean? The dirt is the flesh. That's the flesh, okay? In other words, God gives us sometimes gifts. When he ascended upon I, he gave gifts unto men. But unfortunately, sometimes we can take what God gives us, even in salvation, and waste it on the flesh, okay? Not use it to serve the kingdom, okay? Well, Savior's not going to be real happy with that, okay? Now, the guy who had five talents and made five more, and a guy who made ten talents and made ten more, and when the Savior comes back, he congratulates them both. And to the guy who, came, who made five, you know, had five and made five more, he said, you, here, I'm going to give you five cities to rule. And the guy who had ten talents, got ten more, he said, okay, now you're going to have charge of ten cities. Well, what in the world is that? During the millennial reign of Christ, when he comes back to rule and reign with his body for a thousand years, there will be all kinds of different levels of authority and responsibility, Okay. And it depends on the fruit we bear and how we serve the living king. Does that make sense? You know, I know some of these things, you know, when I, I said, oh, wow, I didn't know that, you know. But uh, there's so much more to understand all of this than sometimes just uh, readily reveals itself. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, I think we're getting not far from the end here, but I want to emphasize there's two ways to live life. By grace through faith and by works. Okay? And they're two separate things. And they're, in fact, mutually exclu exclusive. Okay? Uh, if we live by grace, then whatever works, uh, ideally, are those that are for God, of God. Okay, the Bible says we are created unto good works. Okay, and, and we sometimes think that maybe that's just the ones I come up with. Well, uh, see, he, God, let me just let me say this. Uh, the Bible teaches, Jesus said, it is written of me in your book. Okay, uh, and there was a book. Maybe the Bible, I'm not sure what, but there's a particular book Jesus is talking about. 
in the Psalms and they're repeated in Hebrews, that uh, he followed the dictates of the book, you know, uh, and what he was to do, okay, to give up his life, you know, for the life of many. Uh, but in fact, there is scripture that says that every life, Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. You know, uh, Jeremiah the prophet says, I ordain you to be a prophet unto the nations, you know, before you were formed in your mother's womb. Before you were ever born, I already had a plan for your life. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Okay? Well, that turns out is true for all of us. Okay? This concept of being predestined, you know, is something people don't understand. They get confused about that. Some people wrongly interpret that is by saying, this is so-called, uh, well, that's a, let's see, I forgot the term of it, um, Reformation theology, okay? Uh, that some people, God decides in advance who's going to get saved and who's not. It's not up to you. You, you might think, you, 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 we've already been taught, or sometimes, you know, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that Jesus died for the sins of all men. But this wrong, incorrect theology says, no, 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 he only died for those that finally get saved, and he decides in advance who's going to get saved. Okay? All right, well, that's not biblical. It's not biblical, okay? But this is where they wrongly interpret predestination, okay? Now, let me explain what that is. Predestination was for Christ. Christ. If you're in Christ, then you are predestined to eternal life. But it's, it's not about you. It's about him. So pre it's like two buses out front here. One going to New York, one going to California. Walk outside, you know, which bus are you going to get on? If you get on the New York bus, you are predestined to go to New York. You see? And, and that's the nature. But, you know, if we are in Christ by choice, then I am predestined to whatever he's destined for. And everything that I could possibly need to want for all eternity is already in him. Does that make sense? That's predestination. But it's still, I have to decide. You see what I'm saying? Okay, now, um, on every person, there is a book and a destination planned by God in eternal past for us to discover in finding first born into the family and then seeking God for what are my, what, what are your plans for me? Okay? And, you know, that's something that God decides and has planned, okay? Many times he puts it in our hearts so that we then pursue exactly what he wants us to pursue. You know what I'm saying? But it's about him, not about us. Does that, does that make sense? I'm not saying there's not some variation in there or whatever, you know, of, of we impart thoughts or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? What is... Abortion. You know, this is the saddest thing in the world. God has a book and a plan for every person. At the end of things, now, of course, if a kid is aborted, they still go to heaven. They, they don't have, they, you know, they didn't commit sin. They, they're in a time of innocence. But the saddest thing for God are those who make the wrong choice. And in their book of plans and destinies, God closes the book and says, mission aborted. 